Here's to Main Street, not Wall Street. Here's to being invested in each other. Here's to a return to what matters. Elevations Credit Union. It matters where you bank. Visit us online to see why. Uh, as shared in the, uh, the session before this was focusing in on the older generations, and there were a lot more people at that one, which is interesting. Uh, but I appreciate it because we need to kind of go from both directions in order to make the most uh, impact for our culture. They're all at the bar. <laughs> yeah, millennials don't come to meetings anyway. So uh, I realized I said this in the last session that every industry has a culture, and yours is no different. And I realized that I'm supposed to say real tour. Real tour. Real tour. Okay. So anyway, I just want you to know that I know that. In case it comes out of my mouth wrong, you know, just real tour. I know that. So, well, welcome. We're here uh, to talk about the younger generations and how they impact society and how best to relate to them and some of their insights and understandings. And as you, uh, how many were in the power talk? Okay. I don't want to repeat too much, but uh, let me just give you a whirlwind tour again through the five generations that are alive today. So there's five generations alive today. That has never happened before. We're living so much longer, and the interaction and the opportunities for interaction are much greater than ever before across the different age groups. So we have the oldest generation, and they're known as the matures. The matures are born prior to 1946. Do we happen to have any matures? Okay. All right. Everyone take a, take a good look at our mature right here. <laughs> So, so the mature, and then the matures gave rise to the boomer generation. We can't call them babies anymore. Uh, I think boomers are turning at the they're turning 60 every four seconds and will for the next 18 years. We are aging as a society. In fact, globally, we're aging, which um, is very important to know about how the dynamics of the older generations work. But the boomers were born between 1946 and 1965, 64. And they are huge in number, 72 million. People have called them the pig in the python. And we think in images, a picture. So think about a snake, it's flat on both ends. A python will reticulate its jaw in order to swallow its prey hole. And in our illustration, it's a pig. And all of a sudden, that's what population level is. Flat, and then about 1946, whomp, I mean, it swelled to enormous proportions and held that long until about 1964 and then it flattened out again. It actually went really low with the Xers. And uh, so we have the Xers. How many, how many boomers? Okay. So now the boomers were so large, 78 million. We have never seen that number before in our society. And they gave rise to one and a half generations. They gave rise to half of, uh, uh, or they gave rise to the Xers. How many Xers do we have? Okay. Now, Xers, interestingly enough about Xers, as I mentioned in the Power Talk, is they are the smallest in number by far. So you have the at boomers at 78 million, you have the millennials even larger at 82 million, and then squeezed in the middle are these Xers at 56 million. So you have this huge trough that happens. No wonder they feel like underdogs, because they are in many ways. Their voices politically, they, just, they didn't have quite the numbers that the boomers have or even now the millennials have. And some of the dynamic for that is, in the 1960s, the birth control pill came onto the scene. And that uh, helped forego and, and hold off a lot of pregnancies. So that's rather interesting historically. If you look at that dip, it corresponds, and that's not the sole reason, but it corresponds with one of the uh, introductions to the birth control pill uh, in the 60s. So uh, boomer, uh, Xers are 1964 to 1980. And then the Xers contributed half of the upcoming generation as well as, all right, uh, the boomers contributing the other half, and that's the millennial generation. The millennial generation born 1981 to 1999. How many in the millennial generation do we have here? Okay. Are you the only one? Wow. There was three or four in the other one. So, all right. Well, we're going to ask you to leave so that we can talk. <laughs> so we can talk candidly. We can talk frankly. Uh, just <laughs> okay. keep us honest. Keep us honest here. If we're saying something that just, no way, we need to hear it. All right, good. So millennials. Now, the youngest generation, Bose after 2000, uh, no one has really officially named them yet. Some have attempted and called them the homelanders because we're so into homeland security and, and all that. I have called them the hypers. 
And one of the reasons I did is because the metabolism of our culture is so supercharged and fast that everything is happening at breakneck pace. And we were just talking in the last session about how uh, younger generations don't seem to be as nostalgic as older generations, particularly when it comes to neighborhoods and houses. They move on right away. Well, it's hard to be nostalgic when things are moving so fast. You can hardly settle in on one thing and there's something new comes along again. And we're so mobile and we're moving all over that uh, I, I never thought of that before, but there is that sense of a diminishment of nostalgia uh, among maybe the younger generations. So we're going to take a look at the younger generations. Can't have one without the other because you, we need each other. I see generations as a continuum, not as silos. Many people will look at generations as silos. So you have the matures, you have the boomers, you have the millennials, you have the Xers, uh, you have the hypers. Never the two shall meet. I see it more as a thread, all being sewn together into one. Because if, if, if push comes to shove, there are five generations, but we're all alive right now together. And so it's very important for us to uh, work with one another and to understand one another. There is a part of me in my more radical moments that I think the generational differences are market-driven. That if they can demarcate the different generations, that's a whole other market in which to get money from. And there's a part of me that does think that that's really some of the case. So we're not as different as we think we are, but the market is making us different because that's just another round of more money that they can get through advertising and products and all of that stuff. I just throw that out there, okay? So let's take a look uh, at the younger generations. Now, I mentioned that there are formative themes that shape us as we're coming of age. So think about when you were 15 years old, a sophomore in high school, who you are is probably pretty similar to who you were then. So when you were a sophomore in high school, things may have changed on the outside. There may be more sagging skin and you may have lost some hair, but inside you're still a bit of a sophomore in high school as far as your values, attitudes, and expectations. So we can take a look at some of the formative themes that have come along uh, with these different generations and come up with some insights into their personalities. There are five formative themes that shape who we are. Adversity, diversity, technology, economy, and complexity. So you want to look back and say, what type of adversity did I go through when I was a sophomore in high school? What was the diversity like when I was a sophomore in high school? What was technology like when I was a sophomore in high school? What was the economy doing when I was a uh, sophomore in high school? And then, of course, complexity. Things get more and more complex as we move on and on and on. So that's why we often wax nostalgic uh, for the good old days because it seems as if everything's getting more complicated. Now, if you take those five formative themes and overlay them across a generational cohort, which numbers in the millions, we can come up with certain themes. And I have uh, themed each of the formative er eras for each generation with a C word. So for the matures, it was conflict. And conflict really develop their attitudes, uh, attitudes and expectations because of the conflict that they went through generationally as a group of people. The boomers were in control. That's another C word. Control really helped define who they were as a generation. 78 million. I mean, they had all kinds of uh, influence on culture, on government, on leadership, on business development, all of that stuff. So they're used to being in control. And if you're used to being in control, certain values, attitudes, and expectations emerge. Now we have the Xers. The Xers can be defined uh, collectively with another C word, chaos. As they were coming of age, it was great chaos. Now I always like to uh, look at popular culture and see if there's anything that we can glean from it. In the late 1960s and early 70s, there was a sitcom show called Get Smart. Do you remember Get Smart? Get Smart with a yeah, the shoe phone? Interesting about what was going on in the late 60s and early 70s. Pretty tumultuous times in our culture. I mean, there was Watergate, the Vietnam War was finishing up, uh, a lot going on, and we were feeling a little bit uh, out of control on some level. So here comes this show, Get Smart. Does anyone know the name of the heroic uh, organization that Maxwell Smart worked for? Control. Isn't that interesting? We felt like we were getting out of control back then, and here comes this bumbling police detective who is working for an organization called Control. We may not know how to actually get control. We can laugh at this guy trying to do it, but that was the goal. We have to get back in control. Does anyone remember the name of the enemy organization that Maxwell Smart was thwarted against? Chaos. Isn't that interesting? Chaos. And so you have, uh, of the 
clashes in the generations right now, maybe the, the, the hottest, is the chaos of the Xers and the control of the boomers. And it clashes like crazy. Now, what's interesting about the um, Xers, they're known as skeptics. Oh, they're so, so skeptical of everything. And I always like to just say they're like the swizzle stick in the tumbler of our society. They're not there to try to tick us off. They just want to keep us fresh. And what's interesting, when we did surveys about 9-11 among the generations, though it was tragic for all of them, it was the least surprising to the Xers. Life is chaos. Why should we be so surprised that something like this would happen? That's kind of how things go. And I just thought that was very interesting, speaking into their development as chaos, that it's horrible, it was tragic, but it was the least surprising uh, uh, among all the generations that 9-11 actually occurred. So chaos develops a certain mindset, values, attitudes, and expectations. And for the most part, Xers are intensely pragmatic, intensely pragmatic. They like what works. I don't know how many of you have seen the show MacGyver. MacGyver was a big show with Xers, and MacGyver could take a toilet paper roll and a chewed piece of bubble gum and get out of a high-security prison. Unbelievably pragmatic. And he was a hero for the Xers. And so they like what works. They're extremely resourceful, and they've had to be from a very early age. Many Xers were latchkey kids. Do you know what I mean when I say latchkey kids? They were coming home with both parents out of the house, and oftentimes they were taking care of everything. I was a latchkey kid. I had to get dinner started. I mowed the lawn. I took care of my dog. My sister was there, so I had to take care of her. And Xers have become extremely resourceful from a very early age, and so they can take very little and do a whole lot with it. Now, if you think about um, the Apollo space mission, Apollo 13, it's out there in the middle of nowhere. It has a horrible tragedy, but they're finding out that it's running out of oxygen. And these poor astronauts are actually suffocating to death unless they can get the filtration system working again. The engineers in Houston could only use the material that was available to the astronauts. So they had tube socks and they had cardboard backing from books and uh, masking tape and, or uh, duct tape, all of this stuff. And they developed a filtration system with all the equipment that the uh, astronauts had in the Apollo system and changed the air. Extras are the same way. They can take whatever available and use it. It's called bricolage. That's a uh, French term which basically means making great use of very little resources. And extras are great at bricolage, great at uh, being resourceful. They're keenly balanced. And basically what that means is they want a work-life balance. They want a work-life balance. You ask someone from an older generation what they do, and they'll give you a litany of their resume. You ask someone from a younger generation what they do, and they'll look at you rather blankly and go, I snowboard. <laughs> what do you mean, what do I do? They're just not as tied up in their job and their identity there because they have a life outside of their work. Older generations, that's rather foreign. You, it, to move ahead, you stayed and worked long hours. For the younger generations, uh, extras too, they, they've uh, seen families uh, divorce, and they don't want that to happen to their own family, and so they really do want this work-life balance, and so when you're working with them, you want to really understand that they have a life outside of work, and that they, what's important to them is family. What's important to them is time to spend with their friends. All those things are uh, keenly important to them. They're contractually very oriented, and basically what that means is they don't have a long-term perspective. Because they were growing up when Watergate uh, happened, and all of a sudden there was this collapsing of the government of, uh, of all things. Enron collapsed as a business, and all of a sudden overnight it was gone. So they have been conditioned to realize that things aren't enduring, whether it be the government, whether it be a business, and so they really go with short-term expectations. They may not be around very long in this company, or the company may not itself be around very long, and so I have to hedge my bets. And uh, the way they do that is they work in contractual bit-sized pieces. So if you're working with an ex or what they do is you sit down as an employee uh, and you say, okay, here's the expectation I have for the next year and a half. What are some of the things you can contribute to that in the next year and a half? Let's make a contract. Then you keep each other accountable to that. Then in a year and a half, you sit down and you make a new contract. There may be just tweaks that have to be made or a completely new contract has to be put into place, and you make that. And before you know it, after an hour, a year and a half of all these different contracts, you've had an extra for a pretty long time. 
And so they like bite-sized things. They like to be balanced. They don't have a real long-term uh, view on things because they've seen things collapse. That's part of why they're so skeptical. They've seen the man behind the curtain uh, and the Wizard of Oz. They're relationally very focused. Remember, they're underdogs. There's hardly uh, 56 million. There is not a lot of extras as opposed to the other generations that are coming up the, that bookmark them, the boomers and the millennials. And so when it comes, research has said it, when it comes to major life decisions, Xers are more prone to ask their friends than they are their own family. And this can drive boomers nuts because they'll go to their Xer child and say, Susie, whenever a big decision comes down the pike, I notice you never talk to me, your dad. You're always talking to your friends for advice. How come? And Susie, without batting an eye, will look at her boomer dad and says, well, look, dad, you're divorced twice. You're in debt up to your ears. Would you trust you for advice? Now, it sounds rather mean, but there's something to that. But they're very relationally focused. So they love friends. They love uh, relationships with friends. They're very, very, very important to them. They're inherently skeptical. And as I said, they just, uh, rightly so, because the institutions collapsed, and they just don't have a sense that things are enduring at all. Any questions on the Xers or any insights? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, friends. In fact, I used to have the opening, you know, uh, whether it's your day or week or even your ear, the, the lyrics to that song I used to have memorized because that was Xers and, you know, I'll be there for you. you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yep, 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 that's true, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's just a completely different mindset again. I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. So how how does how does that work out? Yeah. Yeah. And there's no rightness or wrongness to these differences. They're just different. That's, that, that's it. Uh, so there's no rightness or wrongness that the Xers have a bigger you know, uh, insight than the boomers do or the millennials or whatever. It's just different. There's no rightness or wrongness to it. So those are the Xers. Any final comments before we move on from the Xers? Okay, let's take a look. Uh, or Actually, we're still on the Xers. Exposed to consumerism and public relations strategies since we could open our eyes, we Gen Xers see through the clunky attempts to manipulate our opinions and assets. When we watch commercials, we ignore the products and instead deconstruct the marketing techniques. This is what we love about TV. We have learned that content means lies, and in that context lies brilliance. Basically, what all of those mumble jumbles of words are saying is that Xers have great BS detectors. They can smell it behind closed doors. They can smell it. So if you're not shooting straight for an Xer, they'll call you on it. Uh, and that's why marketers have had such a hard time with Xers because Xers see through the marketing that's being used to reach them. To give you an example, I saw a commercial a few years ago about a four-wheel drive vehicle that they wanted you to buy. And they had two Xer friends. And they were going to go fishing. So one Xer friend gets in his four-wheel drive SUV, and the other extra gets in the one that they want you to buy, the really good SUV, and they have dogs in the back. And they're showing the dog in the back of the really nice SUV, and there's classical music playing. I mean, you know, wood trim, the dog is sleeping, having a great nap, going over all this rough stuff. Then they're showing the poor dog in the other vehicle, and it's bouncing around. He can't get any sleep. Then they get to their fishing hole, and there's no room. So they decide they have to go somewhere else, and the commercial pans on to the expression of the two dogs, and the one dog's going, great, I can get more sleep, and the other dog is like, please, I don't want to go back in there. Anyone from an older generation can look at that commercial and say, whew, I've got to have that car. I've got a dog. It's important for me to have that car. Someone from a younger generation is livid, absolutely beside themselves, particularly Xers. Why? Because here's what they're seeing. Why do two friends take two separate cars? <laughs> Drive some nuts. I don't get it. That's bad for the environment. That's bad for everything. That They are missing the message completely because they're like, I don't get that. That doesn't make sense. And so they have great BS detectors. So you have to shoot straight with Xers on every level because they will call you out on it, and they sniff it uh, BS a mile away. Okay. 
So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Calvin and Hobbes, that strip. Uh, it's an extra strip. Uh, I, I'm one of those tweeners, so I was born 1963. So I'm either a uh, old Xer or a young boomer, so I straddle uh, both worlds. But I remember reading uh, Calvin and Hobbes when I was growing up. It was a great comic strip, representing, I think, a lot of uh, Xers. But here he is trick-or-treating. He says, trick-or-treat, and the adult in the door says, well, where's your costume? What are you supposed to be? And Calvin says, well, I'm yet another resource-consuming kid in an overpopulated planet, raised to an alarming extent by Madison Avenue in Hollywood, poised with my cynical and alienated peers to take over the world when you're old and weak. And he's walking away, chewing his uh, candy, going, am I scary or what? <laughs> Xers, are they scary or what? Any comments or insights on Xers? Mm. Is this helping a little bit? <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I love your situation. A boomer and an ex are married to one another. Nothing wrong with that. I think that's great. That creates some... Uh, so you're, you're, you should be teaching this class, <laughs> given all the insights that you have. That's fantastic. Okay, anything else on the uh, exers? Final, final thoughts? Okay. Let's take a look now at the uh, upcoming generation, the millennials. The millennials, 82 million strong, born between 1981 and 1999. They are in the news all the time. People are incredibly interested about the millennials. I talk to people who work with millennials, and there are many stereotypes about the millennials, the most being that they're very entitled. I can't work with someone that's so entitled as the millennial generation. The stereotypes are all over there. They have a very different take on the world because as they were coming of age, change happened so tremendously, it's unbelievable. I can just think of video games. I can remember when my mom and dad came home with a video television console, and it was about as big as this table, and you plugged it into the TV with these big cords, and you had to turn the channel to you. Remember that? I have three millennial kids who have never turned a knob in their life. It's all push button. But on that Game was Pong. Oh, man, do you remember Pong? Boop! Boop! And every once in a while, my sister and I would get in these, you know, uh, intense battles, and she would hit it off the side of the TV and go, boop, 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 and oh, man, it's more than I can handle. You think about uh, uh, video games today. I mean, if you have not recently seen an Xbox or a PlayStation 2 in one of their games, you owe it to yourself to do it. It is un believable, the detail and the immersion of that. And in fact, video games uh, far outweigh Hollywood movies. I mean, a video game will come out, and within a weekend, it'll sell $480 million worth of tickets. I mean, not tickets, 80, 480 Movies would give anything to open at $480 million on a weekend. Video games do that regularly. So, the change has been so incredible just from that leap from when I was playing Pong to now all the hyper detailed accelerated stuff that's just amazing uh, on there. Uh, so change has occurred for them in tremendous ways. They're extremely diverse. As I mentioned in the Power Talk, in the mid-1960s, most of the diversity that was in the United States was of European descent. Since the mid-1960s, that has changed tremendously. So now we truly are and can be called a melting pot, a global melting pot. And the millennials have just come of age with this melting pot all around them. They have no problem getting into real-time chat rooms and talking with kids from different countries all over the world. That's nothing to them. And in fact, it's not just ethnic uh, diversity that they're exposed to. It's lifestyle diversity. It's diversity on every single level. So the millennials are extremely diverse, and they're okay with that. They're open to that. They're very um, uh, okay with all of that. And so they are extremely diverse. Some have even called this generation the mosaic generation because of their openness to the others in their midst. They're wildly connected. Basically what that means, if you have one phone connected to one phone, that's pretty cool. You have one phone connected to two phones, that's cooler yet. But you have one phone connected to 100 phones, now we're talking power. 
And if you have in your cell phone, you probably can send a tweet, and it'll go to how, how many of your followers you have, and it will just tr broadcast to a broad range. They are incredibly connected across the social media spectrum that if a movie they don't like, uh, their friends will know it, their hundreds or more friends will know it within 10 minutes. And that'll keep people from going to that movie. However, they like that movie, man, their marketing is just so different. They just do it in real time and to thousands of people all at the same time. So when it comes to your business, I mean, you want to have a good reputation because they'll let people know within minutes whether this is a good place to work or not a good place to work. And so they're just extremely wildly connected uh, across the board. They're uniquely scripted. And basically what that means is the marketers gave up on the Xers because the Xers were seen right through it. They, they, they didn't want to be sold to. Try all you want, but we're not going to be sold to. The millennials are different than that. So the marketers are realizing, yeah, there's 82 million millennials that we can now market to. And so they've been the center of consumer t attention for a long, long time. And they're uniquely scripted by the consumer culture. So they, uh, they, they buy, they, they shop, they uh, are into uh, brands oftentimes, but they're uniquely scripted by our culture, by society, particularly consumer culture and consumer society. They're technologically very adept. I have uh, three kids. My oldest is 19. My youngest is 15. My 15-year-old is twice as tech-savvy as my 19-year-old because there's a four-year age difference in there, and the change that has occurred just in those four years is so unbelievable that my 15-year-old knows more than my 19-year-old about technology. And so they're very technologically very, very adept, and the younger generations are getting more and more adept because technology is happening all the time so quickly, and they have to adapt and they have to adjust to that. Uh, I can remember when I was in uh, third grade, I had a crush on Judy Greiner. Is Judy in here? Did you too? <laughs> not, not Judy, another yeah. Oh, okay. You too, Judy? I'm, I'm going to run into Judy someday. But I used to uh, write a little note to Judy. Judy, do you like me? And I'd say yes, no, and then I always put maybe. Just to hold out a little hope. And then I would fold this paper up and send it through the back of the room. It became a covert operation to get that note from me in the front to little Judy in the back of the room. And more often than not, the teacher caught it right? Because there's this movement going on, and they're passing this thing back, and that would be the end of it. Today, little Susie, our, our little Johnny has a crush on little Susie in the back of the room, and he's writing the exact same note, right? Do you like me? Yes, no, maybe, but not doing it on paper. He's writing it on a smartphone and then pushing send. And it goes through, the uh, bits go through the ether of the atmosphere and settle in on little Susie's cell phone, bing, and she gets that message. Now, I want you to listen to this carefully. If you're from an older generation, you and I passed atoms in the classroom. The younger generations are passing bits. And you've got to understand what a tremendous radical change that is. If you're from an older generation, you and I passed atoms in the classroom. The younger generation are passing bits. And that has changed everything from communication to how we uh, uh, you know, dialogue with one another. The last uh, session was talking about the challenge of communication. Does there, anybody have challenges communicating across the age groups? Young and old, old to young. Uh, and, and what I said to them is that human beings have had the same problems all the time. Since we stepped foot on the planet, we have had the same problems. Communication is one of them. We have had a hard time figuring out how to best communicate to one another since time began. But certain tools emerged, and so we had paint uh, cave paintings, and they etched in messages to the other cavemen and women that were there. And then the tools changed, and we had the Pony Express, and then we had uh, uh, postal service and mail carriers, and now we have emails, and now beyond emails, we have texts and tweets. The problems remain the same. It's the tools that change, and we need to learn what the tools are because each generation just expects a certain communication method. And so the younger generations, they would rather text if they could their message. Someone from an older generation, pick up the phone. Let's talk. Or face-to-face. Uh, -face. Let's just get in face-to-face. -face. Enough, enough of this tweeting stuff. But it behooves all of us to communicate on the level that they're used to. And so if you're working with an older generation and you're from a younger generation, pick up the phone. As scary as that might seem, pick up the phone to talk to them. If you're from an older generation and you're communicating with a younger generation, 
Learn to text. Do some uh, texting to get that information to them. Here's a little uh, insight that I, I came up with not too long ago, that the more relationally significant a piece of communication is, the least amount of technology you ought to use. The more relationally significant a piece of information is, the less technology you ought to use. So for instance, call me old fashioned, but I still think that young man in love with his girlfriend should get on his knee and give that proposal to her in face to face and not text that. <laughs> if it's about a company party or a meeting the next day, tweet all you want. But it has something to do with an important client and they're really ticked and you know, then maybe you ought to get together and talk about this thing outside of the technology getting in the way. So the more relationally significant a piece of communication is, the least amount of technology you ought to use. But use the tools that the other generation uses. And that's just stretching us. We just have to do that. The younger generation will probably drive them nuts to pick up a phone, but that's what they got to do because that's what the older generation is used to, a phone call. I've had stories of uh, grandma, grandparents and grandchildren missing weekend dates because they kept leaving messages on the phone and the, the granddaughter kept tweeting or texting and the grandparents didn't have text capability and just totally lost each other. The whole nice weekend together was lost because they didn't know how to communicate with one another given the tools that they were used to. Okay? So uh, they're very technologically adept. Any, any insights so far? Questions? Anybody just bitter? Uh, about any <laughs> anyway. uh, I'm calling them the hypers. Yeah, some have called them the homelanders, um, but there's really not an official moniker yet. Yeah, I think it's everything in balance. Um, there's studies. Yeah, the voice has nuances and, and, and things. There's been some. I mean, there's there's a couple studies that I've read. One is interesting is that younger generations sometimes aren't quite sure how to pick up emotions when they're face to face because they're used to the emoticons. They know when you're happy because you have a happy emoticon, or you're sad because you have a sad emoticon, but not quite sure what happy or sad looks like when you're in front of me. And so there's research being done that that might be lost. But then there's an, another uh, research that I read, fascinating, called ambient intimacy. Ambient intimacy. And basically what that means is if you're on Facebook or you're on Twitter and you're following somebody and you're reading their Facebook accounts, that over the course of time, you may know that person better than you do even the person in, under the same roof as you in the house. Because you're following along. You know when they got sick and when they got better. You know what movies they like and what they don't like. What food they enjoy and what food they don't like. It's called ambient intimacy. So and interestingly enough, through social media, through the technology, there tends to be a closeness of relationships that's developed even beyond the face-to-face. -face. So it's a very interesting world that we're living in. Uh, it's just wild times, I think. Just very, very wild times. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you can respond on your own time. Yeah. I mean, if I get an email, well, I can get to this in a couple hours. I don't have to respond to it immediately. And, you know, same with a text or a tweet. What? I heard something. I got all excited. I heard something. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and you just got to do what you got to do. Um, you know, we just can't expect that it's going to be this way, that you're going to text 
me all the time. I mean, you use the tools that the other generation is familiar with to communicate. Yeah, email email is a really old technology when you think about it. It's been around forever. But I can remember just spending sleepless nights deciphering and uh, translating what this message was, going, okay, what is he mad at me? Uh, you know, reading between I mean I wasn't sure. Sometimes I get texts too, and I, I think for my son I go, Oh, he's ticked at me. He's ticked. But then when I, you know, push him on it, then he no, oh, I wasn't ticked at all. That's just you know, so we have to learn to read between the lines oftentimes, which we it's easier to do if we have the nuances of face and, and tonal inflection and things like that. So that's why the more relationally significant a piece of communication is, the least amount of technology you want to use. It's challenging, yeah. But we all have our tools, and we all have to communicate, and it'll, still, it'll never solve the problem. Uh, we'll still always have it. Well, that's why we always put smiley faces and, you know, just to make sure. Yeah, is it ha-ha or ha-ha? You know, and just think about eyebrows, right? Think about community, if you're face-to-face. -face. I mean, eyebrows speak a whole lot, right? I mean, I go, uh, do you know where the restrooms are? Do you know where the restrooms are? Is that your daughter? Is that your daughter? I mean, just... But you're picking it up because you can see going up and down sort of the tone. Um, you know, oftentimes we don't get that from text. But you know what? There's attempts. There's tries. I mean, the emoticons is a great way to kind of, you know, I mean, it, it, it just, it, it, there's no rightness or wrongness. They're just different tools. The problem is still going to stay the same. We're always going to have issues on how to communicate. Tools are changing, and we just have so many tools that sometimes it boggles your mind. So it's just a matter of um, coming to grips with one another and just asking them what, way would you like me to communicate with you? What's the best way to get a hold of you? And they may say, oh, just text me. And that's the best way. Or someone will say, well, gosh, if you can just give me a phone call, I'd really appreciate that. Or if someone from even an older generation, they can you fax it over to me? <laughs> then you have to scramble around to find a fax machine, but sometimes that's what they're used to and that's what they want. So, okay. Anything else? No, it's interesting. She's um, what, how to deliver information now to them has changed. Yeah, well, you're bringing up a, a, an interesting thing. Conventions like this are huge challenges uh, for to reach younger generations because why should I spend the money and come here when there's a webinar or there's a live streaming feed that I can sit in my jammies in my room and watch the power talk or whatever it is at the same time, and so. Uh, I'm impressed. This is a very technologically savvy convention. I mean, um, you know, if you want the, the PowerPoint slides, you just email to a place and they'll send it to you to your email and you can get these slides. I mean, awesome. Awesome stuff. Amazing stuff. Uh, but to attract younger generations, sometimes it's very, very hard. It can be hard because, you know, it's just different. Um, and so they are looking at webinars, but even then that get a little old and then, you know, just because the delivery system. No, I know. It's so confusing. I can hardly keep up with it. But we all have our nuances and stuff. We all have our learning styles and how we like to learn and, and gain information. So, TED Talks, yes. Yep. 
Yeah, they're great. Yeah, they're fun. They're great. They're great. So millennial back there, how are we doing? Okay? We're saying we're not hurting your feelings or anything. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, they're commercially indulged. And basically what I mean by that is marketers have turned their heads away from Gen Xers because they couldn't reach them. And so now they're focusing all their attempts uh, at, at the millennials. Even the hypers, interestingly enough, they've done studies that children under the age of two recognize shapes. And what are brands but shapes for the most part? So they recognize the M of McDonald's before they're even two years old, the swoosh of Nike. In fact, it's so indulged that way, 49%, get this, it's almost half, 49% of the first words out of a uh, two-year-old's mouth today is not mama or daddy. It's Coke, McDonald's. It's a brand. Because marketers have realized that there is an $8 billion market just in those two years and younger. And then they have, you know, the in utero music that you can play and all that stuff. So they're just, I mean, the younger generations have been indulged since day one. Since before they were even born, they were being indulged. So it's a very much a commercialized uh, environment that they're going up with. And they're socially conscious. And this is great because they want to change the world. And you know what's great about millennials? They will. They believe that they can and they will. And they're really conscious about the important things that are going on in the world. So if you are trying to sell to a millennial or you are trying to hire a millennial, you have to speak their language of social consciousness. It could be, you know, that the houses that we build or that we sell are incredibly green from top to bottom. I mean, they want to be involved in an organization that's making a difference somehow on some level. And so they're very socially, very conscious. What's interesting, though, and uh, my son goes to St. Louis University, and they've had protests in Ferguson that spilled over onto St. Louis University last week. And nothing violent, and some of the students got involved in the protest. And I was reading that. My son was a little worried about it and wasn't quite sure. But I thought to myself, you know what? Good for them. We need protests again. Where are the protests? The boomers protested all the time. They were bringing, uh, uh, they're bringing um, you know, focus on different issues, civil rights, women's rights, the Vietnam War. But there's not a whole lot of protesting going on. However, it's going on behind the scenes. We're not seeing it in public on a college campus, but I'll tell you what, there's protests and movements going on uh, uh, through Twitter and through the social media. So there are protests that are happening, just not in the way that we expect. So I thought to myself, okay, it's still happening, but there was a part of me that thought, I wish there would be more protests, you know? But there are. It's just being done differently than what we may be used to, okay? Anything else on the millennials? Any insights? Any? Okay, good question. I'll throw that out first. She's wondering, as a boomer, how do I best relate to a millennial? And you can even say, how do you operate with them in the marketplace? How do you uh, deal with millennials? Any insights anyone's gleaned or any frustrations or ideas? Right, yeah. I mean, think of boom, some of them, hippies. How conscious environmentally and socially were you than a hippie, you know? I mean, um, so there is, that's a good point. There is a lot of common ground that way. Yeah. Interesting, though, because the markers that um, show us the adulthood, you know, used to be marriage was a marker, and then buying that first home was a marker, and then moving on to the marker. Well, that has all moved back tremendously so that millennials, when it comes to buying homes, aren't. Um, 
right now the market's hot because I think boomers are buying and there's some millennials in there, but generally millennials are waiting to forego buying their house. They'll rent or they'll move in with friends or they're going back into their parents. And so it'll be challenging to see how that market plays out as they begin to come more into the market uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Toms. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they're, they're very socially conscious. They, yeah. And good for them. I mean. Right. Right. Okay. Well, we're out of time, guys. Uh, just a couple things. One thing that I have discovered and learned as I've done these generational things is that no matter what generation you're from, whether you're a millennial or whether you're a boomer, we all have certain hard wiring. There are seven motivations that make who you are as a person. You're born a certain way. You're hardwired a certain way, and these never change over a lifetime, depend regardless of whether you're a boomer or a millennial, and it's intrinsic motivation. And uh, if you're interested at all, the tag there is, is discovering how you're intrinsically motivated, how you're wired, because once you know how you're wired, it makes all the difference in the world on how you're going to sell. But if you get an idea of the language and you can say, okay, well, this person's wired this way, it'll make a difference on how you sell to them to speak their language. So uh, my partner, Steve, down there, you can actually take a 10-minute questionnaire right now and it'll kick back to you what your uh, acronym is for the uh, seven motivations. But anyway, that's just a resource. I'm finding out that, that if, it's almost like if you know that, uh, you can relate to anybody across any age group. Uh, and then I have DVDs and books here if you're interested. Okay, thank you for your time. Appreciate it.